Previously on this series of Legends of Night City, we would go on to tell the story of the sadistic cyborg that would kill anyone in his path and would absolutely love doing it. Being made of pure cybertech with just a few bits of human left on him, this man would be known as Adam Smasher. And on top of him, we would also explore his arch nemesis, the meatbag he tries to engage in combat with every time he can, Morgan Blackhand, one of the finest mercs the world has ever seen who helps shape the edge runner landscape. But as we explored both of these stories, there was one factor that stood out in both of their stories, a rogue element that would take their tales and shape them a bit differently, making him out to always be the hero in all of their tales. For both Morgan and Smasher, this individual would play a part in their stories and would shape their destinies going into the year of 2077. So who is this individual? Well, it is the iconic individual loved by many back in the early 2010s and 2020s, the lead singer of the anarchist rock band known as Samurai. This individual is the one and only Johnny Silverhand. But what is his true story? Or is that too hard a question to answer? Where did he grow up? What is his history and what are his tales? Well, in today's video, we will continue on exploring the legends of Night City and try and attempt to tell the backstory of this iconic rocker boy and lead protagonist of the modern Night City tales. This is the story of the proud anarchist and rocker boy Johnny Silverhand from Cyberpunk. Johnny Silverhand was born under the name Robert John Linder within College Station, Texas, on the 16th of November 1988. Not much is known of Johnny during his childhood years with no information about his parents or guardians. However, when Johnny got to teenage years, he quickly signed up to serve his country, lying to the recruitment officer about his age to make sure he definitely got in. Getting into the army, it didn't take long for Johnny to see some action as he was immediately sent to Nicaragua to take part in the second Second corporate war within the year of 2003. Johnny's war was pretty horrific and when fighting on the front lines it was almost certain that he was going to be killed in battle. However after losing an arm and lying there thinking his life was about to come to an end a friend would step in and save his life but this would come at a cost as his friend would sacrifice his own life to save Johnny's. Mourning his friend, Johnny had to continue fighting in this corrupt and manipulative governmental war, and Johnny could really see how horrific it had become. But it didn't take long before the government's military secrets were exposed publicly, and now knowing what was going on within this war and behind the scenes, many of the American soldiers dropped their weapons and their national flags, and hit back against their country the only way they knew how, by deserting the military and refusing to fight for them ever again. But the the government wasn't having any of this, and back on home soil, propaganda campaigns launched to make it look like the soldiers were the ones to blame, and that the people should know who was costing their country. This indeed worked, as many of the unknowing public would go on to hate those who deserted the military and publicly shamed them if they could. Johnny was amongst one of the many soldiers who went against their country's government, as he had lost an arm and a true loyal friend thanks to their lies. After leaving the war and becoming a hated member of society, Johnny would head for Night City and would go on to stay within a hotel for a whole month. And whilst there, he reflected back on his time within the war and realized he had to change going forward. Here he would change his name to Johnny Silverhand as he had just got himself a replacement cybernetic arm to replace the one he had lost in the war. With this new identity, Johnny knew he could not just sit back and watch the government get away with what they had done. And with this new goal in life, he would begin his mission of rebelling to expose all of the world's corruption setting up a rock band that would spread this message that would eventually be named as Samurai. His first member to join the band was his old friend, Kerry Uridine, who had been playing within small backstreet clubs for years. As the band fully set up, their first gig would be within the red dirt within Night City. The band continued for a few years completely independent until the year of 2003, where they would be approached by a producer known as Jack Masters and would go on to sign them up with Universal Recordings now with their full lineup of Johnny 
Kerry, Denny, Nancy, and Henry. With this new record label signing, the band would reach all new heights and a new era started, one of rebellion, with Johnny himself starting the Rockaboy movement, allowing Samurai to become an overnight sensation, reaching the top of the US charts breaking records. But behind the scenes, the band was not holding together well as personal issues started affecting each member, making it to the news on some occasions. One main example of this involved Nancy, the band's keyboard player, who found herself in an extremely abusive relationship. Suffering from this for years, she eventually had enough and would go on to kill her abusive boyfriend by pushing him out of a window. It didn't take long before the NCPD showed up on the scene and arrested Nancy for murder, sending her straight to prison. This event majorly affected Samurai, and the months that followed her arrest, the band struggled to continue, forcing them to break up within 2008. But despite the breakup, Johnny would still go on to be regarded as one of the most popular musicians around, and he himself knew people saw him as such. With this in mind, Johnny felt he could use that star power to set up his solo career and continue to push his messages about, overthrowing governments and corporations. But with him now on his own away from the rest of the samurai, he would be a prime target for companies trying to milk his star power for money. With one record label known as DBS Music, so desperate to sign him that they would start blackmailing him by threatening to reveal his true identity as a deserter of the second Central American conflict to the general public who loved him so much. But Johnny did not cave to this threat and instead signed once again to Universal Music, releasing his first solo album titled Sins of Your Brothers, in which he himself would tell his listeners about his past of being labeled as a deserter and also listing why he chose to go against the government as well as why he is on the particular path he is on now. As the 2010s was now approaching, Johnny had completely changed the world thanks to his first ever solo album. He had now opened people's eyes to what a deserter really was, and thanks to it, the public perception of him and many others had changed to something a bit more positive, and anger was shifting back onto the government and corporations. But this was just the start of his campaign. Johnny now knew he had people willing to follow him into his battle, and now as the decade was ending, it was time to step it up that little bit further. As Night City went into the 2010s, Johnny continued on his rebellious campaign, and after a wave of brutal attacks by the NCPD on the homeless riots to quell them, Johnny would target his movement where the riots were going on, within the heart of Japantown. During this time, Johnny also found himself in a pretty awful relationship with a girl named Rogue. This relationship found the two always fighting, but then coming back to each other. However, in 2011, this relationship fully broke down as Rogue found out that Johnny had been cheating on her. Two years after this event, Johnny would find himself within a new relationship that was much like all of his other relationships, filled with lies and fights. This time it was with the extremely smart netrunner known as Alt Cunningham. But as Johnny played a concert at the Hammer on the 4th of August in that year, Alt would go on to break up with Johnny and attempt to leave him for good. This worked at first, but Johnny was having none of it as he followed Alt outside and tried to convince her to come back with him. But during this time, Johnny and Alt would find themselves surrounded by a small small gang of thugs who were attempting to capture Alt. Johnny tried to fight them off at first, but it was no good. They were majorly equipped with military-grade cyberware and overwhelmed Johnny, stabbing him in the back with two blades. With Johnny out of the picture, the thugs could capture Alt and would take them back to those who had hired them for the job, that being the corporation of Arasaka. Arasaka needed Alt as she had been responsible for the early creation of the software known as Soul Killer, and with her working within Arasaka, she could help develop it into a brand new variant, one that would be a deadly weapon in the wrong hands. Johnny learned quickly who was responsible for this kidnapping and sought to hit them back hard and fast, and on the 5th of August 2013, Johnny would go on to assemble a small strike team that would consist of his ex, Rogue, a media reporter Thompson, and a legendary nomad named Santiago Aldecado, and altogether they would go on to infiltrate Arasaka Tower in Night City to save Alt from whatever fate they had planned for her. But it wasn't just this crew as Johnny would also ask some of the members of his old samurai band to help cause a distraction as they were going to perform a free concert in front of the iconic tower to help start a riot against the corporation. With this riot going on, Arasaka troops would then be sent in to deal with the situation, making it easier for Johnny and his strike team to go 
go and save Alt. The plan worked a treat as they were able to breach the tower with barely any resistance holding them off. But some members of the tower knew what was going on, as when Johnny and his team reached Alt, Toshiro Arasaka was there with her, trying to negotiate with Johnny. But also, just before that, would use the new Soul Killer software on Alt to trap her into the Arasaka mainframe. Whilst Johnny mourned over the loss of Alt, checking her body and finding that it was lifeless, Alt was still alive within the mainframe, desperately trying to get out and communicate with Johnny. But it was no good. She would be there forever. With Alt laying dead on the chair, Johnny wasted no time in killing Toshiro, giving him no real chance to plead for his life. After that, he would go on to gather Alt's still warm body and disconnected her, allowing her to be free from Arasaka's torture, or so he thought anyway. After this tragic loss, Johnny left Night City for good, to get away from the horrific things he had just witnessed, and to be free from the brutality of the corporations and government who were still up to the same actions that angered Johnny in the first place. Johnny travelled for a while until he finally decided to join the Aldecado's nomad community. Maybe taking guidance from Santiago or just knowing they were the best place for him to hide from the corporations and the law. This worked a treat for Johnny as during this whole time no information was recorded for what he did within the Aldecado's or what plans he made. He was completely silent and away from the spotlight. The only notable thing that happened during this time to Johnny was in 2015 where one firefighter named Samantha Stevens would go on to save him from a fire that occurred in one of his studios. You could speculate what caused this fire for weeks. Could it have been a falling out with some of the nomads? Could it have been an attempt made by the law to grab him? Could it have been Arasaka trying to take him out for good? Or was it simply Johnny falling asleep with a cigarette in his mouth? Who knows? But thanks to Samantha Stevens, he would go on to live another day, ready to take on whatever was next. But the year was now 2023, and this is where Johnny's story starts to get a bit confused. But this is most likely how it went. With Johnny still being on a campaign against the Arasaka Corporation, he would find himself enlisted by the American Armaments Corporation named Militech, with a fellow Merc that had been renowned all over the world named Morgan Blackhand. Together these two would assemble another strike force that would take their Militech gear and assault the Arasaka Towers in Night City, to recover important pre-data crash data and in the worst case situation, taking the tower out with a mini nuke. But despite the fourth corporate war triggering this attack, Johnny had other intentions for why he wanted to join Morgan for the assault. Johnny's reasoning was to go back in and try and find Alt once again within the Arasaka office mainframe. Separating into two different teams, Johnny would go on to lead Team Alpha, with Blackhand leading Team Omega. What happened within the tower all depends on who you believe. The first story states that whilst on their task, Johnny and his team came under fire and were pinned down by some of Arasaka's special forces, which included the cyborg known as Adam Smasher after they had found Alt and were trying to escape the tower's labs. Being knocked down in these attacks, Johnny was able to get back up with a Militech SMG in one hand and his precious Malorian in the other and began shouting and provoking Smasher, emptying everything from both guns into him. Smasher, however, was having none of it, as he could not believe the nerve of this rocker boy who truly thought he could take him down. Walking up to Johnny unharmed by his bullets, Smasher would pull out his auto shotgun and with one shot would cut Johnny. Johnny in half. The strike team's netrunner Spider Murphy tried desperately to get Johnny to save him, but in the process was stopped by Rogue, who knew what had happened and told her that he was gone. In her last effort to help or communicate with Johnny, Spider would take out a data chip Alt had downloaded her a long time ago and would go on to insert it into the back of Johnny's skull, whispering to him, I'm sorry, Johnny. But as she went to recover her data suitcase after this, she would go on to realize it had been destroyed in the crossfire. Devastated by what had happened, Spider and Rogue left behind their dead friend Johnny, knowing that one day in the future, he would be avenged, and Smasher and Arasaka would pay for what they had done. The other story, however, told of Johnny's bravery, in which he was able to amazingly survive the initial fight against Smasher somehow. However, the Silver Hand Engram does not disclose this information. Instead, it would show him get into the helicopter to escape the tower that was about to be blown up by the mini-nuke, planted by Johnny himself. But just before 
before he gets on, Smasher would take him down and blow off his cybernetic arm, to then be captured by Saburu Arasaka himself and interrogated. Under their capture, he would then be subjected to their soul killer program as his consciousness would then be scanned and stored on an engram. Whilst it is unknown what exactly took place within that tower, with both stories contradicting each other and Morgan Blackhand being unmentioned within Johnny's own memory, it is a fact that Johnny did not make it out alive and that was all thanks to Smasher and his sheer brutality. Over time, his friends and contacts would forget about him and move on from their revenge mission and the legend of Johnny Silverhand would sadly just be a tale of the past. Likewise with the band of Samurai. Saying all that, however, there would be one place that marked his passing in Night City and that would be within the North Oak Columbarium. Here his epitaph would use his full name and would state Robert John Linder, son of a bitch who never gave up. A legend among legends. But that wasn't the last for Silverhand's story. Just after the Night City Holocaust that was triggered by the Arasaka Tower Raid, the firefighter and Silverhand mega fan that had saved him a few years ago from his studio fire, Samantha Stevens, was able to get access into the hot zone of the city thanks to the help of a techie named Angel. During her exploration here, Samantha would go on to discover a non-detonated mini nuke within the wrecked bunker of the destroyed towers and when finding this, would go on to toss it into the Del Coronado Bay. But at the same time, she would also go on to discover the last remaining pieces of Johnny's body in the ruins of the tower. Realizing how significant this was, she would go on to place it within the nuke's crate to preserve it. But on top of this, she would also go on to locate some of Johnny's possessions, including one of his Malorian 3516 guns, as well as his Porsche. As an avid collector but also mega fan, Samantha knew she had to do something with these items to protect them. Here she would place the nuke case inside her garage within Night City and would go on to house and protect the items for years. Things didn't stop there for Samantha as within the year of 2038, she would go on to discover a group of edge runners who were trying to get their hands on an unreleased song of Silverhands. Seeing them as trustworthy people, she would task them with transporting the crate containing Johnny's body to Los Almos Labs within New Mexico. But before they left, Samantha would take to the side one of the mercenaries she had come to like, a girl named Zara. Having a one-to-one -one with her, Samantha would hand her one of Johnny's Malorian firearms, which was wrapped in a lot of packaging, and told her to keep it. She was to be the new owner for this gun, as she or Johnny was never going to use it again, and Zara was the right person to carry it for him. Eventually, the edge runners would go off to transport the crate, and after a long trip, they would get to reach New Mexico City and deliver the crate to the techie Angel. Receiving the crate, Angel would open it up and witness the body of Johnny Silverhand, and seeing this sight, Angel would simply remark, Hello, my love. Between the years of 2038 and 2077, stories about Johnny Silverhand died down once again. However, Adam Smasher, a newly transformed Borg who had been brought back by Arasaka with barely any human parts left on him anymore, was tasked with seeking out this rumored body of Johnny Silverhand as well as his possessions. It didn't take long for Smasher to find Johnny's body, however, as well as all the other items Samantha Stevens had found venturing into the hot zone. With Johnny's body, Smasher would go on to bury him just outside of Night City with within the oil fields, placing concrete just above him and leaving no markers anywhere to make sure no one knew where he was. As for his pistol, Smasher would keep it for a time until passing it on to his left-hand man who worked with him at the Amanuki docks in Watson, named Jeremiah Grayson. As for the Porsche, Smasher would keep that for himself, also storing it within the containers at the Amanuki docks. The year was now 2077 and Johnny Silverhand, while still a lifeless corpse underneath six feet of concrete, was still out there, at least his soul was, as it had been contained within a prototype data chip named the Relic. On this Relic, Johnny's engram would be housed with all of his personality that his friends had remembered from a time past. Originally, this chip would be safely housed with Saburo Arasaka, however his rebellious son, Yorinobu Arasaka, would steal it from him and would go on to take it to his penthouse within Kobeki Plaza in Night City. The main reason for stealing it was to draw out his father into the public and face him 
one to one. For a while, this secret was safe as Yoronobu would be heavily defended at all times by Adam Smasher. But at some point, the incredible net runners of the gang, the Voodoo Boys, would discover this information and planned on stealing it from themselves so they could get into contact with the legendary net runner that was Alt and have her help them in bypassing the Black Wall within the net. But as this group started planning, they would bring in a third party, Evelyn Parker, to help them brain dance the room for security measures as well as find the location. But Evelyn Parker did not stick to her word and instead betrayed the Voodoo Boys and seeked out a way to steal it for herself. In the end, she would go on to share this information with the fixer, Dexter Deshawn, and assemble a small team of three, two up-and-coming mercs, Jackie Wells and V, as well as a netrunner named T-Bug. As the raid went ahead on Yoronobu's penthouse, everything seemed to be going well until Yoronobu found himself with a guest. His plan had worked and Saburu Arasaka, his father, had come to meet him in person. As V and Jackie Wells hid with the relic containing Johnny's engram within it, they would come to witness the murder of Saburu by his own son and be the main suspects in his murder. As they desperately tried to escape, the relic would be heavily damaged and the only way to save it from being destroyed was by inserting it into their shard slot in their head. For a while, Johnny's engram would start taking over Jackie, but as he was massively injured, Jackie didn't have long left anyway. In the last attempt effort to save their job and also to say farewell to V, Jackie would give them the relic and insert it in their shard slot in their head, only triggering the takeover of Johnny's engram on V's brain. It would only be when V was shot by the man who gave him the job in the first place, Dexter Sean, that the upload process would get worse and Johnny would start fully taking over control, torturing V in the process. But as time went on, Johnny realized that V was their hope at extracting revenge on Adam Smasher and also uncovering more about Arasaka and Alt, as well as seeing his old friends of Rogue and Kerry once again. But with the data being uploaded straight into V's brain, they would be able to witness the events of the past, see all of Johnny's memories or at least how he viewed the events of the past anyway. This would help V understand more about this legendary rocker boy who had appeared out of nowhere and started attacking their body. It would allow Johnny and V to create an inseparable bond where every decision they made was done by the both of them, with Johnny giving his input into everything that happened. But as V sought out a way to save themselves, they would have to decide whether or not they would help solve Johnny and his friends' problems, or go their own path and prioritize themselves. If V really wanted to, they could help Johnny every step of the way, and in return, Johnny would sacrifice himself to save V, allowing him to stay with Alt forever. However, if Johnny were to take over full control of V's body, he would go on to leave Night City, feeling grateful to be alive once again, but also sad that it had cost him a friend in V, whose consciousness would now be gone forever. In the end, Johnny will forever be remembered as one of the greatest legends of Night City, whether that be due to the events of the early 2000s, 2010s and 2020s, with his music and anti-corporation and governmental messages, or due to his actions through the body of V in the 2070s. However people remember Johnny, he will always be a solid part of Night City's history within the 21st century. Maybe his journey will continue on, or maybe his and V's venture into Arasaka Tower would be the last we will ever see from him. Johnny's tale might be filled with lies and maybe many stories are yet to be fully told truthfully, but that doesn't change the fact that he made a marker on this city and many still remember his name to this date. And as his one and only marker within Night City says, Johnny Silverhand, aka Robert John Linda, was indeed a son of a bitch who never gave up. He truly is a legend amongst legends. And that is yet another legend from Night City Explored. The absolutely brilliant Johnny Silverhand, who I felt was played really well by Keanu Reeves, and I'm really excited to see what's next for him and V within the Phantom Liberty expansion. Let me know what you thought of the video, and let me know what legend you'd like me to explore next. But I'd like to say a huge thank you for watching, and a massive thank you to my patrons who support this channel, and allow me to make these videos, including my small fishes, my big fishes, Christopher, Last Persona user, and Arto Krem, my YouTube 
Channel Wise Ones, Fiery Italian, Ico the Wolf, and Sith Lord 906, my Sharks Whale Such Gaming, Jason X117, and Breadbeard, and my Megalodons, Sinus, Cody, Hazy Thoughts, and Chernobyl Stalker. You can also support this channel by following the link in the description, buying yourself some merch or G Fuel with my link below, or by just simply giving this video a like, leaving a nice comment, or subscribing if you haven't already. But that is all for now. Thank you all for watching. Have a great new year and don't party too hard. And I shall see you all in the next one. Cheers.